Welcome to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, where your co-hosts, Cindy Lawley and Sarantis Klamidas from Olink Proteomics, talk about the intersection of proteomics with genomics for drug target discovery, the application of proteomics to reveal disease biomarkers, and current trends in using proteomics to unlock biological mechanisms. Here we have your hosts, Cindy and Sarantis. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Proteomics in Proximity. I'm uh, one of your co-hosts, Cindy Lolly, and I'm here with my co-host, Sarantis Clamidas. Sarantis, why don't you tell people about our guests today? Thank you, Cindy. Happy to be here today and present uh, to great scientists from Helmholtz Munich, Dr. Stephanie Haug, the head of core facility metabolomics and proteomics, and Dr. Gabby Kastenmuller, head of research group of computational health center in Munich. And uh, nice to have you here, Gabby and Stephanie. would like a little bit to know more about your scientific background and your interest in, in the research in the area of proteomics and metabolomics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So thanks a lot for having me, for inviting me. It's quite an honor to be guest in this podcast. Um, well, my research background, um, I am biologist and I actually did my PhD in cell biology in retina. So it's quite far off to what I'm doing today, but not really, because um, very early on, even during my early study phases, I came into contact with mass spectrometry and that got me kind of infected, so to say. So I was um, pursuing my research questions always with methods in um, proteomic profiling and also in this cell biology project in the retina where I did mass spectrometry on glial cells. And of course, ever since I broadened um, the applications and moved more and more towards a technology driven research. And that's where I'm now. So with heading this um, analytical platform where we do still use mostly mass spectrometry, but have also acquired affinity proteomics already, I think, five years ago. Which makes you cutting edge in that space for sure. And I and and before we move on to you, Gabby, I will say I'm glad that you're happy to be here because we we would blame it on Karsten Suri <laughs> if you weren't happy to be here. It was his suggestion to bring both of you on and I've been looking forward to it uh, very much. So so Gabby, please tell us a little bit more. Yeah. Hi Cindy, hi Sorantes. Uh, thank you for having me. Um so yeah, my uh, background is in computer science um, and chemistry, actually. So I'm um, chemist and <laughs> for training and also computer scientist for training um, and came into bioinformatics during my um, PhD phase. And it was actually Carsten Zule um, who brought me into metabolomics, which uh, given my, my background is the perfect uh, thing you um, <laughs> a lot of data and um, back to chemistry at least at least a bit so um yeah so during my postdoc phase that i did with um Hassan Zure, um i uh, was brought into metabolomics not so much proteomics yet but uh, what uh, we are interested in is really to understand uh, the role of um metabolism in health and disease. And of course, when you think about metabolism, it's not only the metabolites as the products or, or players in um, a metabolism, but it's a lot also about proteins, of course, and all the interactions uh, you see between all these different layers, including genetics that's, uh, of course, also coming in. And uh, um, in my group, we really try to bring together all these different layers to help us understand what's going on in metabolism um, in a more systematic way on the molecular layer so that uh, we can use all these new techniques and information. 
I love it. I, I'm i just going to kind of take a step back and give some definitions of a few terms to give context. Uh, so we think of the central dogma of DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And lots of people talk about multi-omics being the DNA measurements, maybe arrays or, D, or sequencing, and then RNA data being another layer, as you talk about, Gabby. And then proteins are another layer. And then metabolites are even yet another layer. So I just wanted to layer that on because we we talk a lot about proteomics, obviously, and genetics, and just um, the complexity of bringing together all these layers is, is um, there's so much uh, richness there, but it's not easy to work with multiple layers and to integrate these data. Is, is there... I guess, Gabby, I'd ask you um, about your Im- your informatics background or bioinformatics background. Um, where do you see this going? What are the challenges? What? How do we accelerate our understanding of systems? You know, a lot of people call this systems biology of systems uh, to ha- advance precision medicine or individualized medicine, whatever we want to call it. Yeah, one, one problem I see um, is that we have... Um, Usually, we don't have this data all in the same sample or in, yeah. even in the same um, subject, individual organism, right? We have a lot of pieces here, pieces there, some single cell data is coming now, right, for, for um, transcriptomics and so on. We have large cohorts where we have proteomics and metabolomics in, but it's, it's um, not um, the situation where we have, like, uh, a UK biobank scale of data on each tissue, each um, fluid, each uh, person. Um, so when we talked about data integration in the, in the past and omics data integration, it was mostly thought like uh, you need all these layers in the very same samples to make sense out of it. Uh, but what, yeah, it's still very complicated to get that, um, especially in the human uh, case where the access- accessibility to all these tissues that would be of most interest are, yeah, is, is very complicated, right? You, you cannot just access brain tissue easily. Um, and that's true for most of the other tissues as well. So we have to work with surrogates always. The big cohorts help us. Um, but we have to combine all these results at some point uh, to make sense out of it as much as we can at the moment. That's, that's great. And I would like to ask you, come back to you, Stephanie, what is a little more technical in proteomics. Uh, what is the biggest challenge nowadays for proteomics to be included in this multiomics world? What is, according to you, because you have worked with a lot of proteomics uh, platforms, and what is your feeling? How is the biggest challenge there? Yeah, um, proteomics is kind of um, developing very fast and um, challenges, of course, are still um, to keep the balance between high throughput and still yet high sensitivity and um, robust quantification. So we want to have at least those three parameters um, at a very high level, and that is... Um, more and more successfully done in proteomics nowadays. So there's a lot of development with increased sensitivity um, from the machines, so the mass spectrometers. Also a lot of increased throughput um, methods. So we have, meanwhile, um, routines which could measure 120 samples per day or something like that. So connected with robotics in the front end for sample preparation, that is quite something and we are moving to what we want. However, there is this one huge challenge which still remains and that is basically um, studying the proteome of plasma or serum. So these are the two body fluids which are the most dreaded sample for any mass spectrometrist because the um, protein abundance is um, so 
um, disbalanced in these samples. So one has like one protein making up for more than 50% of the total abundance. And it goes like that. So a total of 20, only 20 high abundant proteins make up more than 99% of the protein abundance. So it's a very disbalanced proteome. And um, in tissues, that's not so much of, of a problem, but the challenge still remains for plasma and serum. And this is where um, at this point um, of technology development, mass spectrometry methods fall a bit short because they cannot um, deliver the required sensitivity. They can, of course, deliver the uh, accurate quantification and, as I said, also the throughput, but the sensitivity here is lagging behind. And that's where kind of complementary methods now come in more and more. And this is mostly the affinity-based methods because there you can kind of target specific proteins and then include an um, amplification step to increase the signal to kind of fish out the low abundant proteins. So, but um, taken together, all these approaches, um, proteomics is kind of coming of age. And now, hopefully, we are um, entering a, um, well, after the genetic and the genomics phase, we are hopefully entering a proteomics phase in discoveries. That's great. That's great to hear. That's uh, to hear. Do you, you mentioned about the plasma and the serum. Uh, have you seen also a, a need from other type of matrices? I know this has done great work with uh, drive dot spots, but uh, have you seen also other type of matrices that it's emerging in the research area? Yes, Nowadays. drive dot spots, for example, as you mentioned, that's for sure a matrix to look out for because that's, of course, something that's a very hot topic because it would enable home sampling. So everybody, so in a bright future where proteomics is kind of, um, well, very important parameter to um, um, discover diseases early on. One could envision that everybody is kind of screening his or her own blood once a week or something like that at home. And then you would uh, rather microsample that on something equivalent to dried blood spots. And um, also their measurements are well feasible. Other matrices, of course, there's other body fluids. Um, one has to take, really look carefully into that, what the gain is. Um, yeah, one could also type other body fluids, but every body fluid comes with its challenge. Which yeah, is, yeah, that's true. That's where the technology expertise comes in. Um, I think this area of discovery and certainly leveraging, I think mass, I love this message that there's, there's this complementarity between mass spec methods that are, that are arguably the gold standard, uh, and will continue to be that essentially, um, pivotal to moving things to the clinic, certainly, uh, historically and in the future. But the complementarity of that with, um, affinity based methods, these methods like OLINK that that can fish out or pull these um, proteins out of solution that are more low abundant. Um, I, I'm wondering about the less sexy side that I think Gabby, you've, you both of you have been involved in around um, driving the ability to have data publicly available as much as possible uh, so that it can be crowdsourced uh, in the analysis. I think that, that you've both been big advocates for this. And I just wonder if we can talk about the importance of that. I say it's less sexy because sometimes it's a requirement of publication. Um, it does it, it's, it's, a uh, it's work to maintain, uh, databases that are publicly, um, accessed, but it's absolutely such an essential part of the scientific method. And I wonder if you might comment a little bit about the importance of that and, and your passion what I think is, is a passion uh, around that, that I share. Yeah, I think that, uh, so there is so much money invested in uh, producing all these uh, different uh, data that it's uh, really 
the best you can do to really leverage each and every part of it uh, to, to share the data. Um, and of course, when we are talking about comparing um, different platforms, it's not so much about comparing, but as you say, um, using the complementarity of these um, measurements, right? They, they are telling, they have an overlap, telling you the same thing, reassuring <laughs> what, what you see with one platform and the other, but there are also things that you only see in one, but not the other. That does not mean that they are wrong, but it can really um, explain a lot and you can learn a lot about um, also a, a certain platform by comparing it. We also have that and use that heavily in metabolomics, right? Where you can, if you compare the measurements between NMR and MS, you can really um, tease out new signals in interesting signals in NMR and also in MS that you would ha wouldn't have seen otherwise. Now, when, when you ask me about sharing, of course, there are uh, some issues um, also with sharing of data. System. In, in many of these older cohorts, it's a problem. It's a problem of data protection. It's a problem of the consent that, uh, that people gave, right, not to share their data. And I think that has to be respected. So I think it's equally important to um, share the results, we have a lot of results, right? That's uh, almost equally as much as, as we have data, we have at the end associations, be it associations with genetic variants or, or diseases that um, also do not fit in a, a publication, in, in a format like a publication. Um, so very often in the past, things ended up, interesting associations just ended up in in supplements, PDFs that you cannot query, right? And uh, yeah, in our research, we would argue that each and every of, uh, uh, of these associations between, let's say, one protein and genetic variants in one gene, that is, is a story on its own and can be a story um, and important information also for a person interested specifically in that gene, specifically in that protein, specifically in a metabolite. Um, and if um, a researcher from the more um, experimental field cannot um, access this knowledge, then it's also a problem, right? It, uh, yeah. um, we try to, uh, to also share the results we have. So these long lists of associations, and we try to share that in a way that people who do not have bioinformatic training um, or the, the capacity also, right, of, of, of downloading like gigabytes, uh, terabytes of, of data to look into one gene or one protein or one metabolite. So we try to make it accessible through web servers where, where we um, enable people to query that way, right? Their favorite gene, their favorite protein. We will share. We will share this link later, all right, uh, Sandy, because I think it's a great, great people that can go. And I, I'm, I'm amazed with this amount of data that are there. Even though for me that I'm not my informatician, I get a lot of important information. And I think this is it's important to make democratic. We're saying if only we democratize data. And I think this is actually what we're doing there, democratize data. And a lot of pharma, they will appreciate this way of seeing data nowadays, you know. And yeah, it will be great, guys. I really encourage you to play with this portal, go through this portal, because you will learn a lot uh, about how uh, multi-homes could be integrated, actually, in a very easy way. And uh, yes, please, sir. I'll... I'll can I just layer? Yeah, I just want to layer onto that, Sorrentis, and say so. So, Gabby is a co author on uh, a, the, a nature paper that came out in October that we've talked about before. We certainly talked to, to, um, to uh, Chris Whelan in a separate podcast episode about the work before that nature paper came out. But the, the data are individual level data that are shared publicly on the UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform. Now, researchers can apply to get access to those individual level data and do their own uh, work with those data that includes proteomic, genomic, um, much of it exome sequencing now. Um, 
and uh, clinical uh, mar markers, phenotypic data. But the uh, the associations between the genetics, as Gabby describes, those those you know genotypes and protein levels, those associations have been run in the past, there's no need to rerun those analyses. And so the beauty of these resources is that you don't have to rerun them. You can you can look at the different p-values, you can adjust your p-values, see which ones are significant according to the um, the standards of, of uh, multiple tests that you want to um, use and play around with those, those metadata. And as Saranta says, we will post the link to those data uh, in the um, in the show notes because we highly recommend that folks go play with those data and and one example of a way I use it I'll just give one more use case and then I'm going to give it back to Sarantis but but oftentimes if I see a signal that's been identified by a customer in in plasma uh, say there's three or four proteins I'll often go and look at what are the associations with those same proteins from those metadata. So you can you can download it by protein and see all the genetic associations with that protein from the, that massive data set of over 54,000 uh, UK Biobank participants. So it's um, it's a it's an enormously helpful resource. I'm not a bioinformaticist either, and I uh, I use it um, quite frequently. And used to have to use Excel tables. And now I can go uh, go directly to the source. Oh, Thanks for great. letting me. Uh, oh, I have, I have, uh, it's, it's an amazing topic, and I have <laughs> a lot of questions. And uh, I mean, I also like to ask you: uh, we are this, we are hearing a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know, this is a lot of papers, a lot of discussion about that. Uh, we know there's also a lot of buzzword around this. How close we are to create, let's say, accurate models? According to how close or how far we are to create accurate models for prediction, for example, based on artificial intelligence nowadays? Are we close, or what is your what is your thoughts about that? So um, I think that depends a lot on which disease we are talking about and uh, what we really want to to predict and how uh, much the prediction um, is. Um, on a certain individual. So um, I know there is a, is, is a real hype at the moment with um, artificial intelligence. So um, what we can use more on that layer of omics data at the moment, I would still call it machine learning. And um, that, that's where these prediction models you are referring to are also coming out more. Um, so I think the, uh, if, if we are close <laughs> in that sense that having um, um, all these measurements now for so many people with all that additional information, I'm sure we uh, can tease out um, clinically relevant uh, ones and that we can follow up. But it's not, so at least that's my opinion, um, it, it's not uh, the same uh, type of um, model that people talk about when they are now fascinated with the large language models and that generative uh, um, AI where uh, you um, what you see when uh, looking into uh, the media with the, with the with the all the images right where where um, new images are created uh, f from the knowledge, from the models you have. So um, these models have been built on much more data. So images are out there in, uh, yeah, you have much more to learn on. And, and, and it's about text. In, in, in biology, I think we are not quite there. <laughs> um, people... Um, try to use these uh, the, the, the same techniques now, and I think it, it won't take long um, to also see um, successes there. But it's it, it's not the same as with in a team. It's great. It's great. Yeah, and if I, I may I, follow. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. please. Yeah. I would like to directly follow up on this because I totally agree with Gabi and um, I feel very comfortable that you suggest to call it machine learning <laughs> before we um, before we involve artificial intelligence. Um, so and and 
I, I just want to make the point, um, in the end, it's not about discovery, but about application. So in the end, it will be individual people who, who want a clinically accurate decision. And if we involve all the new markers for actually more accurately predict or diagnose some condition, what we will need is to perform a lot of groundwork to get this um, um, actionable in a clinical um, setting. So it's really, and there we have to go. I mean, we can aim high with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all these visionary applications. But in the end, we have to come down again and do the groundwork to actually make the markers accessible in a clinical context. And there we still have a long way to go. I mean, there is, of course, clinical chemistry. There are many assays already in the clinics, but most amazingly, many of them are in the clinics since more than 40 years, unchanged. So there is a lot to be um, added on. They, they provide very good value, but there is a lot of room for actually translating biomarkers into the clinics. And, but you, you know, you realize the level of groundwork you have to do when you just start with thinking about SOPs, developing standard methods. Um, we have been involved in such an initiative in Germany where Maspec is meant to be brought to the clinics on a long-term goal. So maspects for proteins, I have to say, because metabolites are already there in the clinics, metabolite measurements. So this initiative, it's a Germany-wide initiative. It's funded by the um, BMBF, so it's MS Courses. And there we actually team up um, with the four different cores to perform um, ring trials. And there we do the total groundwork. So just look at what we can see with WASPEC, what can we see in every sample from every lab, um, irrespective of the methods or the machines or else. So there is a lot of groundwork still to do. So, and we also, of course, explore the affinity methods in this respect to see where we can go. I think where where um, uh, all these new learning methods, uh, artif artificial intelligence, can help us is getting ideas, getting hypotheses. But um, really, what what we really need to go to the clinic with uh, anything, right, is understand what it means. And if I understood correct, Stephanie, the biggest problem for the clinical biomarkers, because apparently there's a need for clinical biomarkers and it's an emerging need. And there are not so many out there, or there are not so many well validated and need to be expanded, let's say. It's more the, let's say, the show piece, it's more the, the background work that exists, right? Rather than the technology yeah, you have or. To also yeah, I mean, um, there's also such simple things. Uh, so what we do in the explorative research setting, we always use relative quantification. So you throw in comparative data from like 200, uh, 1,000, or with the UK Biobank, even 50,000 samples. And then you have like arbitrary units, those relative quantifications. But that doesn't tell you in the end if an individual comes in where is he or she in the scale? So you need to have absolute quantification. This is the groundwork for the clinics and we are not there. But one can go there and for the markers, which um, deserve it, so to say, which are well validated in all these discovery cohorts, one should go there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think bringing, I think characterizing, I think your point about characterizing the signatures, I, I will say one of the researchers was on stage at a precision medicine meeting and he said, uh, somebody was talking about how they've got um, artificial intelligence to extrapolate an understanding of African diaspora populations so that they can do better at treating those populations with signatures. 
So they were using the point that they have a small amount of data on these populations, but they can extrapolate. And I remember the response was, I prefer real intelligence over artificial intelligence. In that case, we need, we need more data to understand the diversity to feed into the future, whereby we are then leveraging that information to then go, it's almost like we have to go big, and then we have to go small. And when we go small, what I'm hearing is they have to be exact quant approaches, right? And so I think talking to folks like you to help us understand that path to the clinic is critical because, and just to make our lawyers happy, um, O-Link is a research use only technology, <laughs> but certainly there are customers that are leveraging it to build these midplex 20 protein assays. You know, Octave Bioscience is a great example where they're exact quant and they're able to be clinically validated by independent evaluation. So just to give Make sure our lawyers are happy with us. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's a good point. So I, I have also... Yeah, please. Yes, please. Can. I, 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 I like the idea to, at, at some point, bring also more complex um, signatures into the clinic where not only, it's not only one protein or one metabolite, but really signatures where we can capture interactions better, for example, or a, get a clearer uh, picture of different uh, mechanisms playing a role in a, a certain in a certain patient or, or, or a person going to the doctor, right? And, but that's, we are far away from this, uh, I, I think, because we, we need the understanding how things are connected. And that's the phase where I uh, see um, what we do at the moment, right? So uh, we try to understand how things are connected by integrating all these big screens, uh, the, all the information that we get from these big screens. So I actually, can we can we just focus now? Because I see, you know, what you're providing there as a as a service um, is essentially a rising tide that's lifting all boats, right? So you've got your agnostic tech technology, you're providing the right guidance for different researchers that are using different technologies for what might help them get to where they need to be. Can we talk a little bit about what you offer, the kind of services you offer, um, you know, who might benefit from this? Are there, is there an opportunity to um, collaborate with you all? What, what, are, is there something to be said about, about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, my analytical platform is totally open to collaboration to academia and, um, well, even companies if they are interested. But we are, of course, mainly academic. Um, so, and what we offer is actually um, solutions. So, a little bit tailored solution for scientific questions by using proteomics and metabolomics techniques. So we do, of course, um, pre-designed assays. Um, I would put O-Link in the pre-designed portfolio because it's um, basically a targeted method, which is um, just measuring what is in the assay. And there is the different um, variants. Um, we offer them all. and um, but. We also have, um, we could also in metabolomics, for example, design um, new methods to discover certain metabolites if needed. So we are totally flexible there. And in proteomics, that's also something we regularly do with mass spec. So there's all the portfolio like interaction proteomics, phosphoproteomics, um, extracellular matrix profiling, you name it, we, we most likely also have it or can at least make connections to someone who is expert in that. It's a very broad field and it's um, taking, it's quite a challenge to stay afloat, so to say, but um, yeah, and we are yeah. accessible. Anytime. Yeah, to, yeah. To, in order to lay this foundation that we're talking about, it takes funding. And I know that you're, you know, you have you are uh, you apply for funding. I know you're on many publications. Both of you are uh, of the the direct research and different disease areas. I think you're you're probably a, a um, jack of many trades in that in that regard. Um, but I think I think the point is we need to we need to drive funding to uh, uh -huh. to maintain these valuable resources and expertise. Um, 
and this is a general thing for basic research. Like I think we have to we have to fund basic research in order to arrive to to, eat, to translation and to arrive to pharma. We need to to help from basic research. That's for sure. I have also a biological question, if I'm allowed, Stephanie. It was always had in my mind about the proteomics, the plasma proteomics, and when you correlate back to tissues, right? How many proteomics proteins in the plasma? you are correlating with tissue, are tissue specific <laughs> in percentage? Because I, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> this is a very good question. I mean, you could, you could even go easier and ask the question, how many proteins are in plasma? And I think nobody can answer this yeah. at this point. <laughs> because, I mean, if you haven't seen it, that the reason might not be that it's not there, but that just, the other stuff is covering it. So I I would suspect that every protein could theoretically be present in plasma at some time point on some occasion because I mean plasma or the blood is touching everything in our body. So it's not reasonable to assume that, um, I mean, if any cell on the way is just um, degrading, then every protein from the cell could theoretically be found in plasma. So I think this is a ph philosophical question. It's like a cell type decomposition, right? It's like you can, and, and I think we've been trying to do that with RNA-seq in blood for a long time. Yeah. But I mean, that's also the, the, big, um, the big opportunity in plasma because it will report on any damage that is in our body ongoing. So that's basically why this is such a promising um, um, sample, despite being very challenging. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I think so. from what would um, can what uh, plasma proteomics um, can show quite a bit also in, in healthy uh, cases, right, is what uh, the immune-related um, signals are about or the status is for a person. Um, so in, in, in that inflammation, regard, metabolomics and proteomics is really highly complementary uh, when, when you think about blood metabolomics and, and proteomics because... Uh, yeah, from in, in blood uh, for the metabolites, you see a big mixture uh, what's coming from all the different uh, tissues, liver, kidney, um, all of them, muscle, all of them are metabolically very active. And for metabolites, it's really the, the um, medium where, which used for the transport of these things from one uh, organ to the other. Um, but the readout that you get from plasma proteomics um, is is really very much complementary to that because you need the immune system basically. Gabby, um, can in you the, in the uh, um, healthy uh, population individuals? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and understanding that transition to disease. Gabby, we don't get a lot of people to talk about metabolomics on here. I'd love to just talk a little bit about. Um, I think that I think of metabolites as like the um, the money that uh, that the microbiome pays to the body for rent <laughs> for renting space in the gut or wherever you know microbiomes are unique. Is that how you think of it, or can you fix my way of thinking about it? I just find metabolites are giving us signals that are beyond our organs, but are are also part of this community that we are just starting to understand with sequencing approaches that allow us to sequence things that we haven't had to grow in a petri dish. Absolutely. So so it's a chemical, um, the, the chemical language uh, that is used between uh, microbiome and, and, and the cells uh, of our body, right? The human cells of our body. So I also see that like that. But um, Sometimes I feel that the, um, it's a bit um, over uh, yeah, over interpretation of the of the microbiome also happening. So it's it's in, in waves, right? I have uh, seen another wave, an earlier wave of the microbiome uh, before there is uh, one now or has been uh, now. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not important. I I think it's tremendously important. But and a lot uh, goes via metabolites, but also via uh, imprinting the immune system, right? So these are bugs we have to 
cope with and uh, in part fight against them, but also use them. Um, but uh, it, it's not, so the metabolites in blood are definitely not uh, only about what what the microbiome uh, gives into, in, into the soup, into the play. It's, it's really a, um, also a transporting what is produced in the liver uh, to get it to the muscles where it's needed and, and so on. So uh, that's what we see more at least in the metabolites as they are measured now. But I know it's, it's not about metabolites today. It's more about but it's <laughs> But it is all part of, yeah, these are intermediate phenotypes that are helping amplify our ability to understand real-time health, right? So I do, I do appreciate them and the complexity of integrating proteomics and metabolomics. So thanks for indulging me. <laughs> Uh, can I, I, I'm allowed to I mean, because it's really interesting the topic and you know, the plant proteomics is uh, fascinating you know it's, I mean I always also wondered are there any protein complexes that survive in plasma proteomics under these conditions or have you seen Stephanie have you isolated some protein complexes that uh, are, are staying there and they're functional yeah well the most prominent protein complex if you want to call it like that in plasma is of course extracellular vesicles I mean, um, this compartment is rich in vesicles, all kind of vesicles, and they are getting a lot of attention nowadays. Um, we also look a little bit into this. It is a bit, um, so there is a big chance to also, um, vesicles go into plasma by several means. Also, of course, from donor organs that shed those vesicles. So it might be very interesting to um, pull out organ-specific vesicles and um, find some markers in there or with them. But um, I think there is yet another challenge to cope with, but I'm not really very well in this field, uh, well I'm knowledgeable in this field. But if you freeze the samples, you most likely also destroy parts of these vesicles. So, and that of course poses a serious um, limitation because typically the samples are stored frozen because that's what preserves them best but not in the case of vesicles so yeah that's all i can <laughs> yeah so, so my ten, some of my tendency uh, my, my tendency and conservation is always really important for proteomics but also for other uh, any other let's say molecular yeah molecules, for metabolomics right? even and, uh, more i mean that's yeah, degrading yeah and yeah super yeah. fast so yeah mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, protocols there for different type of matrices, for different type of uh, analytes, right? And that's that's also a big challenge because there's not any unified protocol, right? Say for everything, that would be amazing. Yeah, that's super. I can't imagine talking so broadly across so many topics with anyone else. I mean, we have covered a lot of different areas, and I think, like I said, I think you both are. You may have started out in one area, but you've become very broad in your understanding and your um, importance as a collaborator to many researchers. So I, I will. I looked in a database of Olink publications, and I'll say um, Helmholtz has been prominent in over a dozen publications just in the last few years. So it's um, it's exciting, and and all of that I think uh, uh, required some of your involvement. Just in our last couple of minutes, I'd love to to let each of you uh, say a last a last a last word. And I also wanted to acknowledge Matthias Arnold, who I think was pivotal in in uh, helping upload some of those UK Biobank data because he's been very generous in answering questions about those data with our customers. So I just wanted to give a shout out. So if you want to give any shouts out, although it's always dangerous because you might forget someone, but um, but please, Stephanie, anything, anything, any last words from you? 
Yeah, okay. I may um, just follow up on what I started to elaborate a little bit um, before that the groundwork towards the clinics is really something which I feel has to be tackled now. And at this um, point, I would like to thank all the great collaborators in the Klinspect M consortium in the Munich area and across the MS Courses consortium, consortia. So we have a lot of... Um, cool interactions there and um, we have our first paper out and I'm looking forward to a bright future with bringing mass back or the alternative methods but in any um, case proteins into the clinic so it's a long Fantastic. we'll put a link endeavor. to that we'll put a link to that publication yeah that sounds great and Gabby yeah I would like to thank um Ben and Chris, um, who brought us into that big um, proteomics project from UK Biobank. Um, it, it was really a great uh, collaboration. And um, of course, we have uh, worked on proteomics with Carsten Zule before and hopefully will do in, in, in the future. Um, so, yeah, these are um, really uh, yeah, big scientists um, have having broad vision. And of course, I also uh, like to thank my the people in my group um, who, who did that, right? So it's uh, Nick, Maria, and of, of course, Matthias. Um, he might be a good candidate for a new podcast. <laughs> um, Let's do it. I love it. Um, yeah, then, um, of course, in our case, we, we did also some of the proteomics work uh, in collaboration with Claudia Langenberg. So she also um, brought us into some of her big uh, studies. Um, so as I said, proteomics is not the, the core of our scientific work, but we are so convinced that we should bring all these big omics screens um, to the people to the experimentalists, to the biologists, that we are always happy to be on board um, for making these surveys and also improving the surveys, uh, hopefully in the future, together with all these great collaborators. Yeah, and to the informatics scientists, because they're going to build us these algorithms that will help us get a, a better understanding of all of these data layers. So thank you so much, Gabby. And then, and then Sarantis. No, I would say only like a take home message, data sharing is caring, right, at the end. And uh, it's important to share and important to share data, especially nowadays with all of this big data available. And this will uh, bring science and uh, drug development processes up front. And looking forward for more and looking forward for more data and more uh, more analysis. Thank you very much for coming. You're actually, it was, it, was a great, it was a great time for us. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. And so just for our listeners, if you enjoy this content, please share with someone you think might be interested. If you have feedback for us or guidance for future episodes, please email us at pip at olink.com, which is uh, stands for Proteomics in Proximity. So thanks, Gabby and Stephanie. I am so happy to have you here. And let's see how long it takes us to actually get Mateus uh, scheduled <laughs> onto this podcast. That'll be fun. I hope he agrees to to chat about some of the, the aspects he's passionate about. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, brought to you by Olink Proteomics. To contact the hosts or for further information, simply email info at olink.com.